So, today, uh, we're going to continue with multi-level models, and I'm going to teach you about variant slopes. Uh, this is the part of the material that I have tentatively entitled Adventures in Covariance, uh, because now we have to take those populations of, of varying intercepts for and make them multidimensional. And what's going to happen here is we end up with multivariate distributions of parameters. And we're going to model matrices. We're going to have posterior distributions over covariance matrices. So this is a little bit of a mental hurdle. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, but it does come online. You've already been working with multivariate uh, distributions, uh, the posterior distribution. Uh, and we used to assert that it was multivariate normal. Now we will actually uh, have multivariate priors in our models. Um, that's, our, that's the major project today. And that'll let us get uh, through multi, uh, varying slopes, which are a powerful extension of the pooling concept to regression coefficients as well as intercepts um, so that the effects of treatments can vary across units in the data as they nearly always do in reality. And uh, then we're going to hopefully get started today, but maybe not finish, but get started on uh, an extension of the multi-level concept to continuous categories. Uh, and I'll explain that when we get there, but the mechanism that makes this possible is something called Gaussian process regression, which some of you have probably heard about. It's kind of in vogue in certain areas of biology and social science right now, really useful. Uh, so I want to give you an introduction to that as a way to model spatial autocorrelation and, and lots of other things as well. But it's a natural extension away from our, our discrete unordered categories like tadpole ponds uh, to continuous categories that may have different amounts of similarity. <coughs> Okay. So if you're in a multi-level context, would you be centering your sample like you would in a cluster? Ooh, this is subtle. This is a great question. Uh, can I punt on it? Because it's very subtle, actually. And I think I'd need like 15 minutes of some slides to do justice to it. Um, let me see if I can like put together a slide or two on it, maybe for next week. Uh, it's subtle because it, in a multi-level context, when you center only within a cluster, you change the meaning of the data. It's a different model. So you, and it's not necessarily a bad one, but it changes what's going on. Uh, so maybe I can come up, I'll, I'll make a little note to myself to do this. It's a great question. Um, okay. So, all right. Uh, very quickly, last thing to say about ordinary varying intercepts. Um, I jumped over uh, classic over-dispersed count models, the beta binomial and gamma Poisson, otherwise known as negative binomial, for no good reason. Um, last week, because uh, I said we would deal with that same problem of over dispersion with multi-level models, and uh, which are generally much more expansible than those uh, beta binomial and gamma Poisson models. So I'm gonna do uh, just three slides very quickly on this. Uh, there's no new technology here, um, but this is a way to get over dispersion of counts. Uh, so the classic problem is empirical count distributions, even after you condition on all the predictors, typically have variation in excess of what the likelihood expects there to be. So uh, remember, with count distributions, the variance scales with the mean, uh, both for binomial and Poisson. You don't have a separate independent parameter like you do in the Gaussian. Gaussian's a weird special limiting case. Uh, all the other distributions, the variance and the mean scale together. Uh, there are parameters that are common to both of them. And uh, so you can predict the variance knowing the mean for models as simple as the Poisson and the uh, binomial. And what we find is even after we condition on everything, there's excess variation. And this is easy to understand. There's stuff that we haven't measured that's creating diversity across the cases. That's why there's over dispersion, nearly always. Um, I have yet to see an ecological data set, I keep challenging people, that does not have over dispersion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking for one. So if you guys know one, please, I would love to include it as a homework problem or something. Uh, but uh, uh, I have yet to see one. Um, it's easy to understand how you can get uh, over dispersion, that's through heterogeneity. You could get under dispersion through uh, actual correlated effects, autocorrelation. You could get it. That's uh, just I haven't seen it in a real data set. So, um, what varying intercepts let you do is they let you model that heterogeneity. They give you distinct intercepts for each case. And then, since we're in a multi level context, we simultaneously estimate the population of those intercepts. We get a variance parameter for how much over dispersion there is. So now that sigma in the varying intercepts distribution is a measure of the over dispersion. And you can use that to simulate out uh, the variation you'd expect, um, just like in where we ended on uh, Tuesday when I talked about 
uh, simulating to new clusters. Right? It's the same mechanism. And all the code for this uh, example I'm about to show you is in the book, of course. Uh, I won't show all the code here. Um, so let's revisit the Oceanic Tools data. You remember this from, was it last week? Two weeks ago? How many weeks ago? Last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. It was. It was two weeks ago. Yeah, time flies for me, for you guys too, right? You're suffering more than I am, but I'm suffering too. And <laughs> I live in a timeless world of math. And <laughs> um, so uh, Oceanic Tools data, remember, this is there are 10 cases here, uh, 10 different oceanic societies. Um, we're interested in the association between the magnitude of the population size and the complexity of the toolkits. Uh, and um, there's definitely over-dispersion in these data. If you model it as a pure Poisson distribution of the tools, conditioning on population size, you find there's a lot of excess variation in the data, of, uh, way beyond what the Poisson distribution expects. And remember, the Poisson distribution is has a crazy small variance. The variance equals the mean in a Poisson distribution. So it's actually really tight around the mean. Um, and we nearly always see more than that. So how can we cope with this? Well, add some varying intercepts for each, each, as I say here, island, but it's really society, each of the 10. So you think of this, each case now gets its own varying intercept. And yes, that's OK. That's no problem at all. Um, and we can estimate it. You might think of this as having a parameter for the residual. Uh, and we estimate the variance in the residuals. And that measures the overdispersion. Um, but still, the model ends up predicting way better because it models the overdispersion. It doesn't expect the constrained variance. Uh, but it also estimates the additional variance we should expect from new observations. Uh, the technology here uh, that I've introduced is just in the red boxes, and it's the standard varying intercept technology. There's nothing different about it, but the purpose here is different. It's to cope with over dispersion. Does this make some sense? Um, and then uh, the code to produce these counterfactual plots is, is in the book. Uh, there's nothing new about it. In the upper left, real quick, this is the old model we did before just with log population in it without any, uh, with no varying intercepts, so it expect, doesn't expect any over dispersion. Um, and then what I'm showing you are the 50%, 80%, 95% uh, posterior intervals for the mean. Uh, around the mean in the, is the black curve. And then the actual data, you can see there's a lot of dispersion around it. Um, I'm not showing you the Poisson distribution of predictions, but it's pretty tight around it as well. Uh, then on the upper right, I'm showing you counterfactual predictions simulating out, the marginalizing over that variation that's, that's there in the sigma, posterior estimate of sigma. Uh, again, the code to do this is in the book. It's just like the chimpanzees example we ended on on Tuesday. Um, we get a lot, it expects a lot more variation now because there's actually quite a lot of remaining variation after accounting for the log population effect. And the variant intercepts pick that up and they give you parameters to describe how much of that variation there is. And that's the value for it. So it corresponds, if you had done this with, um, uh, with a gamma Poisson model, which would be the, the old technology for doing this, um, you get very similar posterior predictions. Uh, and there, um, but what you wouldn't be able to do there is have the particular estimates for each society, because you don't get those parameters in those models. You just integrate over all that uncertainty. Um, but they have a very similar purpose. It's just this framework's a lot more extensible than the two. Uh, and then very quickly at the bottom here, I'm just doing a quick model comparison to show you that unsurprisingly, the varying intercept model fits a whole lot better um, and gets all of the uh, uh, okay, UK weight. Um, and uh, you can see in the graph version of the model, even, even accounting for the pretty big standard errors here, um, it's, it's a lot better than the other because there's a lot of over dispersion in the count. So again, I said, I've never seen it at least an ecological data set with a Poisson variable. Uh, the over dispersed model always wins, uh, just hands down. Um, and, and so why should you care? Well, because not accounting for over dispersion can be a masking effect. Uh, it can hide the effective predictors that are in there, right? Because there's it's just like, it's, it's just like anything else. There's variation data you haven't accounted for could be obscuring the effective predictors that are there. So accounting for the over dispersion is really useful, even though it causes some additional grief. Uh, it's worth worrying about. Uh, you don't have to do it in the multi-level framework. A negative binomial or gamma Poisson model would work here just as well. Uh, but these are these are a lot more extensible because you can start adding varying slopes too, uh, and all the other stuff we'll talk about today. So is the motivation for this clear? Uh, there's a short section um, in the chapter, the end of the, um, I guess it's chapter 12. Yeah, chapter 12. The end of chapter 12 about this. I encourage you to take a look at it. No new technology, uh, just a new intent um, and way of thinking about it. Okay, we're going to spend the rest of the time today talking about var uh, varying slopes. Let me give you the quick phenomenological intro to them, and then we'll take the long, slow tour of building them up, 
of constructing them. So varying intercepts allow the means uh, uh, to vary by the cluster. So in the top graph on the right-hand side of, of this uh, slide, right-hand side of this slide, you see varying intercept. What you do is every every unit is represented here by a different regression line, um, but the slopes are still the same because the slopes are still constant across the clusters. Uh, but the varying intercept parameters let, give them different levels, so that's all they let them do. Uh, but obviously, slopes could vary by cluster too. Uh, and I'll give you some examples, uh, lots of examples on the next slide about why that might be true, and probably nearly always is. Um, and then you get a picture more like in the in the bottom right of this slide, uh, where intercepts and slopes can vary across units. Uh, in fact, remember you learned early on in this course that intercepts and slopes are nearly always correlated, uh, and this is especially true in nonlinear outcomes uh, in, in GLMs because you've got ceiling and floor effects. So if an intercept pushes uh, the baseline rate of something up really high, up towards the ceiling, then that unit can't respond as much to the treatment. And its estimate of the slope will be closer to zero. Uh, it's just a necessary consequence of the way ceiling and floor effects work. And so these things become correlated through, through nature, uh, through the biology or the sociology of the phenomenon and the way uh, the behavior gets generated. Um, but we'd like to take account of that and measure it so we're not tricked uh, by these things. Um, and so it, intellectually, you can think about this. If you've got some parameter and it's, a, it's assumed to be constant ac across a bunch of separable units in your data with exchangeable indices, you can always split that parameter up into a big vector of parameters and assign a distribution to them and adaptively estimate that distribution, get a regularizing prior. And that's the multi-level strategy. Uh, so you can, the easy way to construct varying slopes is just to treat slopes exactly like varying intercepts. Assign a Gaussian prior to them, learn its mean and standard deviation from the data, get adaptive cooling, you'll get shrinkage for them, and you'll get better estimates of the slopes than you would if you treated them as completely separate, or if you assumed that they were constant across all the units. Constant across all the units is maximum underfitting, right? Uh, and completely separate across all the units is maximum overfitting, We'd like to be just right in between. We like our forage just right, or whatever that fairy tale is. I don't remember now. <laughs> and uh, so the adaptive, uh, the adaptive approach uh, gets us closer to that at least um, than the two extremes will. Uh, so to put put some some biological and sociological meat on this, um, what are real phenomena in which slopes vary? Well, the one that I'm into now is this this personalized medicine movement. Uh, is a big thing now, and it looks like the federal government's going to put a lot of money behind research on this. And this is something a lot of physicians have known about for a long time, is that people respond very differently to the same drug. Uh, so aspirin doesn't induce the same pain relief in everybody. And not everybody, ibuprofen doesn't work for everybody. So if you have a good physician, they work with you to figure out which medications actually work with you. Uh, this is famous for a lot of the, uh, the psychoactive uh, therapeutic drugs that came, came in vogue in the late 80s and big in the 90s, like Prozac. Uh, Prozac helps well, some people a lot, and a lot of people not at all. <laughs> it's one of those classic things. It became popular because it has very little side effects, uh, so you could prescribe it basically at low risk, is the idea. But uh, lots of people clinically who it doesn't do anything for at all. Um, and then the big story, scandalous story, going back centuries, is that almost it used to be true that pharmaceuticals were tested entirely on men, white men, <laughs> and then shipped around the world. Uh, and white men are not the species, right? So, newsflash. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, the big thing, it, even if it's not about sex, it's just body mass. The average guy is bigger and has a lot more blood volume. And so, we're, we're all getting these standard sized pills, right? And taking the same amount, right? So, you read your ibuprofen bottle and it says, adult, take two. <laughs> right? But adult body mass and blood volume, which is the thing that matters here because it's dilution, uh, varies orders of magnitude. Uh, maybe not in this room, but almost. I mean, I don't have a lot of blood, but <laughs> some of you probably have twice as much as I do, right? Because you're normal people. And, uh, uh, and that's a big effect. I have a, a colleague, Joan Silk. Some of you know Joan. Uh, Joan's, Joan's also a pithecine size, she jokes. She's, uh, she's like five feet tall or something like that. She's a spunky primatologist. Uh, and um, she's worked in equatorial Africa most of her career. And uh, never had malaria because if she takes a standard antimalarial prophylaxis, it's like it's effectively three times the dose for me uh, because her blood volume is lower. And uh, meanwhile, the rest of us take the prophylaxis and we still get malaria. Just we just don't die. That's the, that's the benefit. But she actually fights it because she's getting a massive dose. So the personalized medicine um, 
uh, movement is about uh, measuring this, the variability in response to these treatments. And this applies to surgeries and tons of different things. There's a tremendous amount of variation in uh, the therapeutic value of medical interventions. Um, these are varying slope effects, right? And the, even in a case where, on average, a medication or a surgery does nothing for the population, it could still help a lot of people, right? So the, now the average effect is not what's of interest, uh, but rather the variation in what explains it. Does that make some sense? So varying slopes help you pick up things, even when the average beta coefficient is zero, the treatment could still have mattered a lot for some of the units, and you want to measure that. This is famous in educational uh, programs, right? Uh, back to school programs help some people, this is my next example. They don't work for others, and it depends upon language preparedness and background and other issues. In particular, they, they don't help boys nearly as much as they help girls. Uh, and I was talking about testosterone being a poison just before class started, and that might be something to do with it. But um, that's a big deal. And so the, if, if, uh, if the testing pool is balanced for sex, uh, and it mainly doesn't help boys and it does help girls a lot, the average effect might be zero. But you made exactly the wrong inference about the, the value of back-to-school programs from that. Right? Does that make some sense? Um, okay, uh, so not every unit in, in an abstract sense is going to have the same relationship with a predictor. Uh, variation matters, uh, uh, whether we're trying to make inferences about what did happen or uh, predict what will happen if we intervene. Um, and we get, of course, uh, we're going to get better estimates of slopes to here because we're going to use pooling. And pooling helps here for exactly the same reasons it helps with intercepts. There's really no uh, difference about it. Um, so let me, let me give you uh, uh, an extended example where we're going to build up by construction a varying slopes model. And this is going to take a little bit of time because um, once you introduce varying slopes, uh, you want to also tie them together in the population to the intercepts. Because remember, intercepts and slopes are nearly always highly correlated. One informs the other. So let me give you a contrived another simulation case. Uh, the contrived cases are good because they're simple. You know all the moving parts. Uh, and they can prove to you that the thing works. This will be a contrived simulation case where we construct up um, a, very, a basic varying slopes model so you can understand all the pieces to it. Um, but really all we're doing is we're going to take that uh, adaptive prior from varying intercepts on Tuesday, and we're going to make it two-dimensional in the basic case. Uh, but it could be higher dimensional than that. It can have 100 dimensions if you've got a bunch of predictor variables and you want to let them all have varying slopes. There's no problem. Stan can handle it. I know, because I made it do it. And uh, you can take it. Um, uh, so let's build up the basic case. Uh, remember on um, back on Thursday of last week when I introduced multi-level models, I talked about coffee and how for uh, Clyde Waring, every, he can remember the motor memory to make a cup of coffee, but he's never had coffee before in the rest of his brain. And so every cup of coffee is the first cup of coffee he's ever had. He's like, wow, this is great. What is this? Stuff? It's kind of addictive. And then he puts it down and walks away a minute later, and he's like, oh, what is this liquid that I can drink? So, uh, uh, and, I, and I ask you to imagine, for example, if, or I don't remember if I did then, but now I will. Imagine we have a robot that's programmed to visit cafes and order coffee and record things about it. But we'll take a simple case, like how long it waits to get its cup of coffee. So think about the Paris and Berlin cafes again. Um, and what I asserted in the, in the basic example for varying intercepts was that uh, pooling data across the cafes lets you learn faster about the true weight, average waiting times at both cafes. Um, and the order you visit them is irrelevant. Uh, you do all of the information should move between them, and this is what varying intercepts models do. Now we're going to complicate this measurement a, 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 again. Now imagine we have a robot. It's like a, a fancy uh, a Roomba, right? With like a little coffee holder on it. You guys know what a Roomba is? Yeah, they're great. Hack your Roomba. Google it. <laughs> and uh, it's going to go around to cafes, and it's, it's going to order cups of coffee, and it's going to record how long it takes them. It's going to visit each cafe in the morning and the afternoon, and the wait time varies depending on the time of day. So now we've got a predictor variable, what time of day it is. And the slope parameter in this context is the difference in wait time between the afternoon and the morning. Um, and what I'm going to assume here is that the average wait across almost all cafes in a population of cafes, the average wait time in the morning is longer because more people are getting coffee in the morning than it is in the afternoon when they're less crowded. But uh, uh, the sl intercepts, uh, let's say the intercept is the average wait time in the morning, and the slope, which is the difference between the afternoon and the morning, are correlated in this population. Because uh, the busier, more popular a cafe is, the busier it is in the morning, say, so you have to wait a long time. The Roomba has to wait a long time to get its cup of coffee. Uh, then there can be a bigger drop in the waiting time in the afternoon. Uh, but for a, for a cafe which basically nobody ever goes to, you get your coffee instantaneously in the morning and the afternoon either way. 
So these are the two extreme examples I put up on the slide. On the right-hand side of the slide, I mentioned Cafe A, which is popular. It's where all the hipsters go. And uh, uh, the wait time in the morning is like seven minutes on average. And the wait times in the afternoons drop down to around four or five. Um, there's a pretty big drop, a couple minutes, because fewer hipsters are they're sleeping in the afternoon, right? <laughs> they're hip parties to go to. <laughs> Paul has a paper about this now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, uh, Cafe B is unpopular. This is Cafe I go to. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you basically wait two minutes uh, all the time. Um, there are some days where, uh, on average, if there is a difference, it is faster in the afternoon. You can get your coffee basically instantaneously because no one's in this uh, horrible place. Um, <laughs> Um, so it's still true that on average slopes are, are are negative. You wait less time in the afternoon, but the the difference is smaller now because there's a floor effect, right? The the physics of the thing of the very phenomenon constrain uh, the slope, it's the change in slope depending on what the intercept is, and this creates a negative correlation between intercepts and slopes in the population of cafes. Does that make sense? And these things happen for good physical reasons, good mechanistic reasons, in all kinds of systems. Um, and why we'd like to model that correlation now is because it enhances pooling. Now we actually get transfer of information across parameter types. When you learn a cafe, how long you're going to wait at a cafe in the morning, even before you've ordered a cup of coffee in the afternoon, you can make a better prediction about how long you're going to wait in the afternoon because of knowing something about the structure in the population. Does that make sense? So we'd like to program our little Roomba to model the correlation as well. Uh, and then pool across intercepts and slopes, right? So you, you can imagine, for example, that it malfunctions and there's some cafe it doesn't visit in the afternoon, but a bunch of other cafes it has visited both in the morning and the afternoon. You've got a good estimate of the correlation. Using the intercept of that cafe, it only visited in the mornings, you can make a great better prediction of how long you wait in the afternoon because you exploit the knowledge of the population structure between these parameter types. Does that make some sense? We're going we're gonna to pull this out in an extended fashion and do it computationally now. But this is cool. It gives you pooling across parameter types. Uh, so not only are slopes pooling information across one another to enhance, uh, to do adaptive regularization, and intercepts doing it, but intercepts and slopes are doing it across. Um, and it's awesome. So, so this is the value of remembering and pooling. And it arises purely from just defining a multivariate prior for the population and then learning its shape. And that's the varying slope strategy. So here's one way you could look at it. Um, imagine an idealized statistical population of cafes in which they have Gaussian distributions of intercepts and slopes on the, on the logic scale. Uh, or rather, yeah, these would be on, on, well, I just centered these. So they're on some, some crazy scale. Don't worry about it. <laughs> they're centered. And uh, Gaussian distribution of intercepts, Gaussian distribution of slopes with less variation. They don't have the same, have the same amount of variation. Um, and I've constructed here an example where they have a negative correlation. This negative correlation is actually pretty strong because slopes don't vary that much. So this is like minus 0.7, something like that, I think is what I drew it as, um, in the population of cafes. So each point in here is, is a cafe uh, and arising from the sort of physics of waiting times and the work capacity of the hipsters that, that work at the cafes um, induces these negative correlations. Uh, so learning this negative correlation, the idea is you want to learn about this population at the same time you estimate the intercepts and slopes for each cafe, because then you can do adaptive pooling across both types of parameters. You with me so far? We're just in concepts. Yeah, Katrina. If these are standardized, why does the slopes have a smaller range? Uh, well, they're, they're not standardized. They're just okay. I don't know. I just drew a picture. That's all. <laughs> that's, that's fine. We'll do the real thing in a second. And there's code in the chapter to do the, we're going to do a full simulation of this. And we're going to do it all on actual like duration scales. Um, so then nothing will be standardized. And it'll be a little easier. Right? So the units here don't matter. There's something, whatever. Okay. Um, so let's uh, talk about a population of cafes. This will be a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution now. Uh, and to define a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, we need a vector of means, the mean for each uh, uh, variable in it. And these variables, are the means now we're talking about is the average intercept and the average slope. Then we need a variance covariance matrix, which defines how the intercepts and slopes both vary and covary. Uh, and you've been doing this forever. This is, remember, quadratic approximation for the posterior distribution. It is exactly the same description. Now this will be a prior inside the model, and you'll get a posterior distribution of this distribution. I told you this was coming, right? You've got distributions of distributions. 
exhibit is happy. Right? We, we have pimped your model. And it's like, yo, I heard you like distributions. So I put distributions in your distribution. <laughs> so I'm glad people still remember Exhibit because he is one of the great minds of our civilization. <laughs> no, I'm very, he's very entertaining. <laughs> so um, it says more about me than him, maybe. <laughs> but uh, Anyway, so here in the bottom left of this slide, I'm trying to show you the basic anatomy of a covariance, covariance distribution. You've seen this before, but it's worth reviewing it. For those of you who haven't uh, done a lot of, of linear algebra in your life, um, in the two-dimensional case, it's pretty easy. There are four cells in the matrix. Uh, along the diagonal here, um, from the upper left to the lower right, you have the variances, which are just the squared standard deviations. Sigma sub alpha is the standard deviation of intercepts. That'll go, I'll show you how that works in a moment, but that's it's the same kind of parameter we had before. We square it, we get the variance. Um, sigma sub beta is the standard deviation of slopes. We square it, we get the variance of slopes. Uh, the other diagonal uh, are the, is the covariance uh, between the two, which is just the product of the variances times the correlation between them. So we've got three parameters to estimate, to estimate this matrix, two standard deviations and a correlation parameter. And we need to find priors over this thing, too, which is going to be one of the mental hurdles. Uh, but we'll get there. Uh, we don't have to do that right now. We'll get there in a minute. Does this make sense for now? So this is our task. And we, we uh, learn these parameters from the data, and we assign this distribution as a prior, a multivariate prior, to the intercepts and slopes. Uh, so uh, we can have exploit the multidimensional pooling that arises from it. So let's do this by construction, which means let's, I want to teach this to you as a simulation, in the sense where we know what's happening, so you can see how it works. Um, what I've done here is simulated 20 cafes. Uh, we're in a population of cafes in which um, Intercepts and slopes are negatively correlated. So on the horizontal, we have intercepts uh, in minutes um, that you'll wait for your coffee in the morning. And on the vertical, we have slopes, which is the difference between how long you wait in the afternoon and how long you wait in the morning. Uh, and the each point is a cafe. There are 20 of them. And uh, the uh, gray uh, ellipses there are the Gaussian distribution that they've been simulated from. So you can sort of see just the contours of it. I'll give you the code to draw that. It might be something you want to do sometimes to draw that. This is, it's really easy to do, to draw those contours um, in R. It's a package called Ellipse that makes it trivial. Uh, and I give you the code to do it. Uh, but that's just the Gaussian distribution. So the nice thing about um, two-dimensional Gaussian distributions, they define ellipses at the different confidence levels. It's really nice. Uh, conic sections, we love you. Right? Uh, so we're going to say our, our coffee robot spends five days going in the morning and the afternoon to each of these 20 cafes. It ends up with 200 observations. And then we ask, what has it learned? And it reports back to us, and it dumps out a bunch of samples. Blah. Right? So this is how you're used to this in your homeworks. Right? You, run, you, you ask this very sophisticated question of the data in the form of a model that you've carefully manicured. And then the answer is a posterior distribution. You're like, shit. <laughs> and this is, again, remember the interview with the golem. It's always like this. So we're going to do the interview with the coffee robot now and figure out what it's learned. Um, it's just the thing about probability theory, right? You, you ask your question in, in distributions, and you get an answer in distributions. And it's not really what you wanted, but it's what you've got. Uh, okay. Um, here, uh, we're going to take this model piece by piece, but this is the robot's program, and this is how it learns. Uh, and this is, in this case, the model was exactly the data generating mechanism. I know because I generated the data. Uh, in the real world, it never will be, uh, but it's still a good way to learn uh, about um, uh, batches of parameters. So uh, the likelihood probably needs no explanation. The waiting time for obser at observation i is normally distributed with some mean, uh, which is a function of covariates uh, for that and um, uh, a standard deviation within each cafe. Right, the sigma at the very top is the standard deviation and waiting times within each cafe. I have to think of it that way now. Um, the linear model um, now has intercepts and slopes. The, it has varying intercepts, the alpha for uh, the cafe uh, for case i, and the slope, the beta, for the cafe at case i, times m sub i, which is an indicator whether it is, it is morning or not. Right? And... Uh, Here's our multivariate prior. Um, there's a pair of uh, parameters, alpha and beta, for each cafe. Cafe 1, cafe 2, cafe 3. They're, they come in batches of two, right? Because they're features of each individual cafe. And what we say is for any particular cafe, uh, the prior for its alpha and beta, the pair of them, the vector of length two of them, 
is multivariate normal with mean alpha and beta, right? That vector has a mean alpha and beta, which just means the mean of the alphas is alpha, and the mean of the betas is beta. And then a variance covariance matrix, which I'm going to call S here. You with me so far? So this is our first multivariate prior, but it's you've seen these sorts of distributions before, right? You've played with them before. Um, so what is S? Uh, there are lots of ways you can specify S, um, uh, and I'm going to teach you um, a way that I think is most useful that lets you specify priors independently for the pieces of it. Pieces of it, we're going to factor it apart. So let me explain that um, now on this uh, this slide. I call the the covariance matrix shuffle. There are lots of things you can do with covariance matrices. Lots of ways to factor them. And those of you who've had a linear algebra course recently in your life, uh, you know this, right? There are all these great things like Koleski factors and, and things that that can make the computations efficient. And so we're not going to go that route, although that would be useful if I had more weeks in the course. I could I could sacrifice the time to do it. But let me give you a very robust and useful way to do this. Um, so you probably want to make inferences based upon the sigmas and the correlation rho. So let's have those be our sort of atomic parameters inside this thing. The, the covariance matrix itself is not a parameter. Uh, it, it's, or the, there are ways to do that. You just make the matrix a parameter. But um, we're going to instead put priors on its little bits, and it will get constructed from the sigmas, the two sigmas and the rho. Uh, so you think about it this way. For an m by m covariance matrix, so in this case, this is 2 by 2, but as we get more slopes and we let them vary, you could, this would be 10 by 10, right? If you have 10 predictors and you want all their beta coefficients to vary in one intercept, you've got a 10 by 10 covariance matrix. And that's no problem. Uh, well, that's not there's no problem. It'll, you'll have to wait. You'll go get a cup of coffee or two while your computer's running. But uh, Stan can handle it. And this is what Stan was made to do, is big, high-dimensional, uh, uh, multi-level models. Um, Specifying the matrix the way I'm going to encourage you will require m standard deviation parameters, or you can do them as variances, doesn't matter. Um, one's just the square of the other. And you're going to need m squared minus m over 2 correlation uh, parameters, the little rows. So in a 2 by 2 one, there's only one row. Once you expand to 3 by 3, you need three of them, uh, and so on. And it goes up that way, right? Because they specify the binary combinations of the different effects. Um, so you need a total of m times m plus 1 over 2 parameters. So this can get big pretty fast. Uh, and this is what we mean by high dimensional, lots of parameters uh, in the model. So there are several ways to specify a prior on these things. The classic one that packages like Bugs and Jags use is the conjugate um, prior. In this case, it's something called the inverse Wishart. Uh, and the inverse Wishart is the multidimensional generalization of, well, it's the inverse of the multidimensional generalization of the gamma distribution, which we haven't done a lot with. And that, you just heard me say that, and you're like, well, I'm glad we're not doing that. <laughs> right? Um, you don't want to do that. The only reason to use inverse Wishart is because it's conjugate. Uh, that's the only reason. It has no good features otherwise. It's a very annoying prior. And the only reason to use it is because it makes Gibbs sampling efficient. But it has terrible features, especially near the boundary of zero. When you get a standard deviation near zero, it has a lot of pathological sampling behavior. So I'm going to I'm going to discourage you using it. Um, and one of the nice things about Stan is it doesn't care at all about conjugacy. Uh, it doesn't help it at all if something's conjugate. It'll do a great job. So we can do better than that. We can use we can actually use informative priors uh, uh, and regularizing priors that have more sensible behavior. So instead, we're going to do this strategy at the bottom. Uh, this is a classic factoring of a covariance matrix. And if your if your linear algebra is rusty and you don't quite get this, it's okay. Uh, uh, no, lots of people in this class I know for a fact can explain to you how this works. Matrix multiplication is delightful and maddening because it can be defined in any number of arbitrary ways. Uh, but basically all I'm saying here is if we get this thing called the diagonal matrix, which has zeros everywhere except the diagonal where we put the standard deviations, and we have a correlation matrix, so capital R, correlation matrix has ones all the way down the diagonal because every variable is perfectly correlated with itself. And then the rows are in the off-diagonal positions that specify the correlations between pairs of parameters. That's a correlation matrix. That's usually easy to think about, right? And it turns out you get the covariance matrix back by doing the matrix multiplication in this order. So this one does it by columns, and this one does it by rows, and then you get it all ends up being composed as this matrix. It's just matrix multiplication order matters. It's not like ordinary scalar multiplication. Some of you remember this, right? If you've had this recently, you're like, yeah, I got this. Move on, Richard. Uh, you guys with me? So we're going to specify, this will let us specify priors separately on the correlation matrix, 
and uh, the standard deviations, and that's what we're going to do. So this line is just here to define how we build the, co the covariance matrix in terms of the more atomic parameters. And then we have a bunch of fixed non-adaptive priors um, for all those atomic bits. Uh, there's the alpha and beta, weakly regularizing priors for them, um, and then our, our yieldy half Cauchy distribution, a good very weakly regularizing prior uh, for the others. Um, the hard one, this is all easy, right? You guys with me so far? This is all, there's more of these, so that's weird. Uh, but um, there's nothing new uh, yet. The new one is we need a prior for a correlation matrix. And here's where I said we're going to have a prior over a matrix now. So it sounds like a weird thing. Uh, but what this does is it, it creates a, a joint prior for all the little rows inside the, the, the little you know rows. They look like peas, but they're rows, crow. How they pronounce it in ancient Greek? Whoa. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's this very useful prior uh, that I call the LKJ core prior. Rather, that's what the stand team calls it. It doesn't have a name <laughs> uh, that's in general use. Um, let me ex spend one slide explaining it to you and why it's, why it's nice. Um, so this prior is something that comes from a computational statistics paper from 2009 by uh, Lewandowski, Kurowika, and Joe. This is why it's called LKJ. It's just the author's initials. Uh, they call it the onion method, which sounds pretty cool, actually, so I might change it to that. But uh, uh, anyway, so what does this thing do? Well, this is a nice, it's a, it's a distribution over correlation matrices, um, and it's controlled by uh, uh, one parameter, eta, that specifies how concentrated these matrices are towards what's called the identity matrix. The identity matrix has no correlation, right? It's just ones down to diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Um, so when eta equals 1, you get a flat prior over all correlation matrices of the size you've specified. Absolutely flat over every possible correlation matrix that's valid, uh, which is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. So completely uninformative prior in the classical sense. And so if we were looking at a single correlation matrix, the marginal distribution of a single correlation parameter in the matrix, up at the top here in the right column for eta equals 1, it's just uniform. Right? That is... Any correlation between minus 1 and 1 is equally probable in the prior. So that's what flat means. But it's doing that for all of them at the same time. The margins of each will look flat like this. Um, and then what you'll want to do instead, I encourage you, is to use something greater than 1. Because when it's greater than 1, it's, it's skeptical of extreme correlation. So this is regularization, a little bit of regularization. And this is very weak regularization, but it's good and useful. Um, you want to keep it off the boundaries. Make it skeptical that... That anything, any of the that intercepts and slopes are perfectly correlated. That no, I'm skeptical of that, right? So you don't. If you might get a sample in which they are perfectly correlated, or or at least in which a perfect correlation explains the data best, but you should be skeptical of that because that's overfitting, guaranteed, right? So um, use something a, a little bit bigger. Um, two gives you something really gentle like this. By the time you get up to five, there are these little flat regions here, minus one and one. You should play around with it in the book. I give you some code to just sample from this prior so you can plot it out to get an idea. Um, but something around two or four or five, depending upon how complex the model is, works great. Uh, there may be rare cases where you expect really strong correlations. If you go below one, you get spikes of probability at the extremes. I, I can't think of a case where this would be useful, but someone might dream of one. If you do, let me know. Um, but that seems odd. Uh, to me. So all you need to know about this is that uh, it's a good weekly regularizing prior over a correlation matrix. Uh, solves our regularization problem um, in a matrix case. Uh, specifying this in the R code looks a lot like the model. I'll walk you through it because there are some new little, uh, uh, what do we call them, widgets? I don't know. Little things you got to do in the code. But it's the same spirit as before. Um, notice, uh, so I'm going to put the varying intercepts in red on this slide and the varying slopes in green. So you can see the correspondence in the linear model. It's the same as before. If you want varying slopes, just put the bracket and the cluster variable. And Matt to Stan recognizes that. Say, oh, you want a big matrix of these things. Think about how many unique cafes there are. I can do that. Um, and then when you specify the multidimensional prior, you use the little C collection constructor, the vector constructor for R there. Um, and you put A cafe and B cafe in there, and then you bracket them both on the same cafe at the end. That's what we say. There's a pair of them. There's this vector of an alpha and a beta. Uh, and those pairs are unique to each cafe, is what it's saying. And then you have a multivariate normal. And the two on the end means my version <laughs> that let, does the factoring. Uh, and you can do without the two, and then you can't. it doesn't do the factoring for you. 
So this version just does the construction where it multiplies the correlation matrix by the diagonal matrix twice uh, to reconstruct the covariance matrix for you. And then you can input a vector of sigmas and a correlation matrix, which I'm calling here rho, uh, which is what that bold capital R was. Um, uh, with me so far? Notice there's a little vector of uh, means A and B also inside there. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Um, so is sigma, sigma is a vector? Here? Yeah, it is How a vector. How does it know that? Yes. How does it know that? Because <laughs> it knows that there are two elements in the out, output. Okay. On the left-hand side of the tilde, there are two elements, so it knows there has to be two standard deviations. Okay. And you're putting the prior for them to be the same. Exactly. And then so later down, I think I get to that on the next slide. Yeah. Actually, yeah, great. This is, here we go. <laughs> yeah. So Sigma Cafe now in red, um, both of, all of the sigmas get the same Cauchy. If you, if you don't want them to have the same uh, prior, you can put like bracket one and bracket two in the priors uh, in map to stand. And then it, then you fix each element, the prior for each element of that vector separately. It'll recognize that. I know, because it was maddening to debug that. I remember it. <laughs> I was late night with a pot of coffee. Uh, yeah? If you put the uh, intercepts and slopes as deviation from the overall, do you include the overall in? No. Oh, no, no. Yeah, good question. You can, it's same as before. You can take that mean vector out. You can put it in the linear model still. Okay. Yeah, and I'll do that later today uh, so you can see an example of it. Then you just put a zero there. And that the same knows, oh, you want a vector of zeros. I can do that. Uh, and it's, again, it's the same. Then you get offsets. And so these are going to include the offsets. So you, you had a question about this before, right? Yeah. Last time. yeah. And then someone else had a question. Yes? So is, is this generalizable to multivariate multiple regression? This is a, kind of this same idea. So we've been doing with multiple regression, but we predicted single outcome variable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but oh, yeah. we predict multiple. Yes, good, good question. So let me. Let me Translate that real quick, and you tell me if I got your sense right. And uh, so, in a in a multivariate multiple regression, there's multiple outcome measures, um, and you may be using the same or different predictors to model them all simultaneously. Uh, yes, absolutely, this is compatible with that. I, I had a paper last year where we did something like that, uh, and it, it's cool because. Uh, what's great about it is you get pooling across the outcome types because this multivariate prior underneath has parameters in it from a population that includes all the outcomes on top. And so you get data about one outcome filters through the joint probability distribution into the parameters that inform the other outcome. You get pooling in every direction at greater than the speed of light. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's great. Um, it's that Ache paper that I published with Jeremy. Uh, it was like that. We have two outcome types and there's, I don't know, there's, there's this big like eight by eight covariance matrix prior in the model or something that does it all. Other? No? Okay. Yeah, after that, I wouldn't talk either. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, so this, this extends up to madness really fast. You can, you, this is Sparta, uh, <laughs> if you will. Um, okay. And then rho, uh, uh, D, L, K, J, core 2 uh, down there at the bottom. And follow up to Katrina's question, how does it know the dimensionality of rho? Because it knows there's two parameters in the vector, so it knows it's a two by two matrix. Um, you can also give it the start value and, and define its dimensionality that way, uh, but it figures it out. It's got a map to stand has a limited artificial intelligence that tries to figure things out when it doesn't have info. But if you give it explicit start values, it just takes those instead and gets the dimension from them. Um, okay, so uh, you run this model and it samples um, and uh, uh, I should say, you should read in the notes, um, there's this general effect. In, when you run this in stand, it's going to give you some warning from the interpreter about an abs log absolute determinant of the Jacobian. Uh, read the note in the notes about that. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. It might freak you out at first. And then there's a little overthinking box to help you understand what, why you might want the log absolute determinant of the Jacobian. It has to do with changing the geometry uh, of the space. And I do this inside the stand model so that I can do this more efficiently. Um, that's all that's going on. And stand doesn't know that I'm playing by the rules, and so it does It does what I like Stan to do. Stan is fussy. When it thinks something might be wrong, it always warns you. I really like that, actually. I like my software to be fussy. Uh, so it's, it's, it's looking out for you, um, but, but you should check the notes for that explanation. Um, okay, working with these models is the same as always. You can extract samples and go to town. You know the model. You can push them back through the model. Um, link and sim work, uh, and um, mainly because Link and sim don't even see the prior. 
right? Lincoln Center just use the likelihood. So they don't even interact with the varying effects in a direct way. Uh, not with the prior, at least. Um, so first thing I want to show you is just the posterior distribution of rho compared to its prior. So the prior there, that's the LKJ core 2, where eta equals 2, so weakly regularizing, right, in, in the dashed line. And then the posterior distribution, uh, really strong evidence of a negative correlation between intercepts and slopes. I'm surprising because that's what I simulated, and <laughs> we have a lot of data, right? Uh, but that induces shrinkage in both dimensions now, and that's what I want to explain to you next. Are you guys with me so far on this? Okay, so this negative correlation now um, goes together with the alpha and beta estimates and the sigma estimates to define a posterior distribution of the distributions of, of intercepts and slopes. And that's what I'm showing you here now on the left. Um, each of these, uh, well, first let's attend to the, the ellipses. The ellipses are that posterior distribution. It's the posterior median um, regularizing prior, joint regularizing prior of the intercepts and slopes. And then the uh, uh, pooled and unpooled estimates are shown uh, on top. Uh, the blue points, as before in the tadpole example, are the unpooled estimates. That is what you get if you just took the data only for each cafe and estimated its average morning wait time and the average difference between afternoon and morning. You get the blue points in this graph where intercepts are on the horizontal and slopes are on the vertical. The open circles are, just like in the tadpole example, uh, the pooled estimates. And the lines connect the estimates for each individual cafe. So what you can probably see is there's some gravity uh, induced by uh, the, the pooling distribution here, the, the multivariate prior. Um, they, they shrink, not exactly towards the center, but towards kind of a regression line that has the right correlation to go along with it. Now you can see there's kind of a plane in there, a line in there that they're shrinking towards. Um, if, if you squint hard, you can see it. Uh, those of you at home can't see this now, but I'm waving my hand across it, right? There's a line here that they're kind of shrinking towards. Um, and so if you had data that had this, this came from this binary distribution, the best fit regression line would pass right through there. Uh, and that's what these points are shrinking towards. Um, and the shrinkage, again, the more extreme an estimate is um, from uh, the center, uh, of the inferred population, the more shrinkage you get. So look down here at the bottom, right? Uh, lots of movement. Um, I can zoom in. Wait, I should have done this before to show you pooled and unpooled. Yeah. Uh, and then I labeled the contours. 10, 30, 50, 80, and 99% of the, of the distribution. Um, so the, the raw blue points, which are further from the center here, shrink more. There's, there's longer line segments. Um, and then you'll notice that there's this negative slope of them all. If you thought about those little line segments as little regression lines, they're, they have negative slopes, right? And that's because there's a negative correlation between the two. So let's focus uh, to understand why and what this does to shrinkage. Let's focus on this, this one up here. Um, so that cafe has an average morning wait time, right? Pretty much average. It's empirical. The blue point is pretty much right, really close to the average uh, morning wait time. You see that? <laughs> but it has an unusually high slope, right? Which means there's very little difference uh, between its morning and afternoon wait time. It's unusually busy in the afternoon. You could think of it that way. Um, so the model is skeptical of that slope estimate and wants to shrink it towards the mean because it's an improbable slope probably sampling variation, uh, given the amount of data it has. And so it shrinks it, and the slope goes down. It moves towards the center of the Gaussian distribution. But because intercepts and slopes are correlated in the overall population, the fact that the slope moves induces movement in the intercept in the direction of the negative correlation. And then it infers, oh, wait, but if we got the slope wrong, probably got the intercept wrong a little bit, too. The <laughs> intercept is probably bigger uh, than it was. And that's why the open circle is down to the right uh, from uh, the blue dot. Does that make sense? That's the pooling across the parameter types that arises. Uh, and you see this in other places as well, but it's most obvious in these cases where one of the parameters is average and the other is extreme. Then you can really pick up uh, the logical consequence of what we know about the population is that we also, when we shrink one, we got to shrink the other. And then that joint shrinkage obeys the correlation structure. That makes some sense. I know this is very meta, man. The do divide, so this is good stuff. Um, 
And this gives you better estimates. You, you get information transfer not just within slopes, but across intercepts and slopes too. Yeah. So if you specified separate priors for each of these, it would shrink the slope of probably not, not the other. That's right. Uh, they would be the distribution of, of, of say, posterior mean um, varying intercepts and slopes would still be correlated. Uh, but you wouldn't have a, a prior that told you what the correlation was, and you wouldn't get shrinkage in both dimensions. But I guarantee you they'll... The, the fact of the negative correlation will still show up in your estimates, uh, but your model won't understand it and won't be able to do pooling uh, across the types for that reason. So that's the big aid of doing this. And it doesn't cost you much in parameter complexity, actually, because it's adaptively regularizing. So if there's not much correlation, then it doesn't add hardly any flexibility to the model. Uh, it's what's nice about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can, you can see in, in, uh, this is happening to different amounts of different places. Those cafes that are close to the middle, there's hardly any shrinkage going on at all. Um, uh, but the ones that are over here in extreme, they can, in extreme cases, move in the other direction. Uh, so it's not destiny. It depends on where things land. But there's this overall tendency uh, to have that negative uh, shrinkage that obeys what we know about the structure of the both, both types of parameters. Um, this is the parameter scale where the shrinkage actually happens. But we could translate this to the outcome scale. How? Just take these parameters and push them through the linear model. And then on the horizontal here, I have morning wait time, which is just the alpha. Right? It's the same axis, basically, as the other graph. And now we're calling it the morning outcome. And the afternoon wait time, which is the sum of the alpha and beta. Uh, and and uh, the, the Gaussian distribution also transforms. Uh, and now it looks different, but you still have shrinkage, right? Where all of the estimates have kind of come towards the center of gravity of this joint outcomes. Uh, there's a positive correlation on the outcome scale expected between morning and afternoon wait times, even though on the parameter scale they're negatively correlated. Uh, and I just, this, is, this is just a fact of how it works. And I put this here just to tell you that shrinkage happens on the parameter scale. It's how you define the prior. You define it on the parameters. Um, if you did it, uh, uh, if you define the parameters on the outcome scale, so instead of a, a slope parameter, you had two intercepts, and, and one was turned on in the morning and one was turned on in the afternoon, but only one was on at a time, then you get shrinkage on that scale. It would tell you the same story. You'd end up with the same effective predictions, uh, but the correlation would look different. They'd be positively correlated in the population instead of negatively correlated. Does that make a little bit of sense? Um, but notice they're all below that dashed horizontal line, which is the point where the morning afternoon wait times are equal. So uh, afternoon wait times are shorter. Uh, in the population as well. You with me? Yeah. So why doesn't the shrinkage appear to uh, scale with the distance from the mean in the same way as it does on the parameter scale? Uh, so well, it does a little bit. The bottom left is kind of... Yeah, it does a little bit. Some of those points are really close to the invisible regression line that things are being attracted to, so they're not moving much. So if they don't... Yeah, it's like distance from that line that matters now in the two-dimensional space. And in like a three-dimensional space, there's a... There's a plane that everything's shrinking towards, and then the hyperplanes, and you know, we're off in Hilbert space, and uh, all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the answer, unfortunately, is that the, the shrinkage is complicated. It's shrinking towards a structure, and in the two-dimensional space, there's a linear structure that shrinkage is moving towards. In the three-dimensional space, there's a two-dimensional structure, and, and so on. So it's distance from that that matters. Uh, it's complicated, though, but it's not exactly a line. It's like a little ellipse or something in it. Um, Yes? No? We're standing forward. No. You're like, I got this. <laughs> anyway, you got to be patient with yourselves, guys, about this. Uh, this. There's a huge value in model types of this because they use all the information uh, in very savvy ways and you get better estimates because they're regularizing. The regularization is great. This is adaptive regularization in multiple dimensions. The, the cognitive trick to, to grasp just right now, uh, it'll take, you, you can spend a lot of time getting the mechanics and the computation of it. Uh, but the trick to get conceptually and motivationally is that what we can do within single parameterites, we can do across them because there's population structure uh, in the effects in a population. So this is also true. I, I used a bunch of motivating examples about pharmaceuticals. Um, nasty fact about the efficacy of pharmaceuticals is healthier people are helped more by them. Right? So the healthier someone is on average, call that their intercept, the better their response to treatment. Uh, this is the worst fact about medicine ever, <laughs> right? The people you, that most need the help are the ones that get it the least, uh, right? So it's just a horrible thing. And I'm not talking about health insurance, although we could have that conversation. But I'm, I'm just talking about the biology of it. 
if your if your system is functioning well, you get more out of you can you can stand the surgery better, for example, or you or the pain reliever works better. Um, if lots of things are malfunctioning at once because you're old, then the treatments don't work as well. So you get a correlation in these things. So learning about one feature of an individual helps you predict other features, like how they will respond to an intervention, and that's what we get out of this. Uh, and the the posterior covariance matrix has that information in it about the population. Okay. Um, so here's the here's the summary slide. Uh, we have a joint distribution of varying effects and uh, intercepts and slopes now, and this pools information across both types of parameters because in the population uh, they're correlated. You could have a, a, a sample in which there is no correlation or a population in which there is no correlation, and then the model will learn that. And uh, you won't get shrinkage across the types as a consequence. That's right. it's, it's doing adaptive regularization. These models assume there might be some correlation. You give it a prior for that correlation that's weakly regularizing, and it tries its best to learn that correlation structure. Um, and uh, so the correlation between effects gives you shrinkage. Uh, if there's shrinkage in one dimension, it's going to induce some shrinkage in the other as well. And this gives us improved accuracy. So in the extreme case, you could imagine, and, and I gave you this guys before, that you didn't have data that would let you estimate the slope for some particular cafe. Um, but you can still make predictions about it because you get a prior for that from the population distribution that you have. Uh, that's invaluable uh, for filling in missing data, um, which is what we're going to do next week. Uh, we'll be able to fill in missing values through the same technology uh, as we go. You with me? Yeah? You guys seem to be paying attention. <laughs> I do, you always pay attention, but I'm saying it's you're on you're on here. I can see your eyes are aglow and, and you're liking this. And, and uh, again, I call this adventures and covariance because it's very meta right now. We have posterior distributions of distributions. Um, all right, let me give you uh, the most elaborate regression example we've done so far in the course that adds everything that we've ever done <laughs> together. And uh, th and still, this is a pretty simple model, but it will have everything we've ever done. Um, let's do cross-classified varying slopes. We're going to come back to the chimpanzees data now, uh, just because you know that data example, and I don't have to re-teach uh, a data set. Um, and we're going to put varying slopes on both of the coefficients that were in uh, the, the sort of main model of interest here, the model that um, wants to predict pulling the left lever uh, as a combination of some baseline tendency plus um, a main effect of the the, where the prosocial option was, whether it's on the left or the right hand side, and then an interaction with the condition that is the presence of another individual at the other end of the table. So there's three parameters. Two of them are slopes, uh, so to speak, and one's an intercept. We're going to make them all vary. We're going to make a three-dimensional prior that contains them all. Uh, just extrapolate some from the previous example. Um, so uh, the basic way to think about this is when we add more slopes, we just need a higher dimension covariance matrix. We got We've got alphas and two kinds of betas. We have a three by three matrix. Uh, that's all it is. Um, and it really is trivially easy to get map to scan uh, to generate this stuff for you. Um, so let me explain the meat of the model here. This is just the likelihood in the linear uh, model. But I've broken up the linear model to make this cognitively easier to think about. You can write the models this way. I, it, it works uh, nearly always, I think. There might be a hiccup at some time, but it seems to work all the time. And um, you just think of if you read it from the bottom, you substitute each linear model up. Uh, so each of the three on the bottom go into the top one. We have a model, uh, fancy A there, uh, uh, fancy A sub I, uh, is, is the intercept model. And it's an average intercept plus an offset for actor I, um, plus an offset for the block. Remember, we did blocks on Tuesday, right? Remember, two kinds of varying intercepts, the cross-classified model. Um, and then there's a fancy B sub P, right? Uh, this, there's a model for that coefficient, and it's a sum of an average effect, beta sub P, an offset for the actor, and an offset for the block. And those are both varying effects. Um, and then the final slope, the interaction term, uh, is also uh, a linear model combination of three things, an average effect and two offsets, one for actor and one for block. Make sense? And this this makes cognitively makes things a lot easier. I do it this way. Otherwise, because you know I don't have enough working memory to keep my long crazy line of R code going, right? And go on for a while. The spaces make some returns or something uh, and make it work. Um, you don't have to do it this way. At least use some white space and put returns in the line and keep yourself sane. Uh, so we've got in each of these three, we've got uh, three average effects now to model. 
um, as well as three actor offsets and three block offsets. So you can see what, what I've highlighted there constitutes a three by three matrix of parameters. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to make, uh, we're going to go high dimensional now. So, well, it's not all that high dimension. Three is not high, right? Three is just one bigger than two. It's not high. <laughs> um, high is like 20 or 100, which you could do the same way if you, if you were mad. Uh, so we're going to need two multivariate priors now because there's two cluster types, and each gets their own population distribution, their own statistical distribution. Uh, we're not assuming that the actor, the features of actors are related at all to the features of experimental blocks, <coughs> right? Because they're determined separately, right? The actors have their recurrent features across the blocks, and the blocks have their features which are due to things other than the actors, right? That's why we're modeling them as separate. The block effects are supposed to be like weather effects, or whether they get fed them or not that morning, or something like that. Um, and the actor effects are things like how handed they are, uh, and how much they care about the other chimpanzees. So we get two three uh, two three dimensional multivariate normal priors. One for for each actor, there's a batch of three parameters that describe their behavior, their intercept, and their two slope offsets. Um, and this is where I'm putting in the zeros for the two, uh, so that these are all both of these priors are centered on zero, and we're going to put the average effects in the linear model. They already work, right? Back on the previous slide. Um, same for the blocks. There's three block parameters. Uh, for each block, there are three parameters, uh, an intercept and, and two offsets uh, for the slopes. Mean is a vector of zeros, um, and a covariance matrix uh, for each, uh, modeled the same way uh, as before. Uh, let me walk you through this code real quick. There's a lot of code here, but it's just modularly exactly what we just showed. It's just the, the natural logical extension of what went on before. Um, so here I'm just highlighting for you this uh, cribbing where you can make up symbols inside the model and then just define them on lines below, and they just get substituted up, uh, basically. These models run from bottom to top, essentially, so the, as long as linear models are in that order, it should work. Uh, this gets compiled to Stan, actually, where um, they're going to run top to bottom, but it handles the ordering right. So if you look at the Stan code, uh, uh, you'll see that it does it in the right order. Um, and uh, uh, the things inside each of these are the parameters of interest. So let's just look at, um, in red, the actor effects, and in, in green, the block effects. And you see there are two priors. Um, for the red one, we've got three parameter types inside a vector, so it's a link three vector. Um, bracketed on the actor for each actor, and then there's a vector of sigma, sigma sub actor, uh, and a vector of row, and, and a correlation matrix, rho sub actor. Same for the block effects, but now all with the, the word block substituted everywhere that there was actor before. Yeah, and it's really just that easy. If you had more cluster types, copy-paste, <laughs> go to town. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot of stuff here uh, with this. You might have to sample for a while, go get a cup of coffee, but uh, it'll work. Is that a hand or a or is that No, just... I'm just... Okay, yeah, tracing it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. You want me to wait a little while? Or... No, no, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, the notes, uh, this is all the notes, um, and uh, you want to sit down and run it and get some sense of it and play around with the priors a bit and see how strong you have to make them before you start nudging the posterior around. Um, do experiments like that to get used to these uh, models. Uh, any questions about this code, though? The only trick uh, to note about it is um, you'll notice that I have, I've called this M13.6 prep, and I only set it to two iterations. Obviously, that's insufficient, right? Two samples. The first one will be a warm-up sample. The second one will be an actual sample. It will be terrible. That will not converge, I'm confident. Uh, but all that does is it compiles the model down to a binary executable uh, that will be hidden in your temp directory. <laughs> uh, and then I call resample, which is also in the rethinking package. I described this in the Markov Chain Monte Carlo chapter. And it takes that compiled model and distributes it across cores and runs three chains in parallel. Uh, and it doesn't have to recompile the model, uh, which is most of the time that you're waiting, probably, right? So um, that's what I do here. And I sample this thing to death, uh, 5,000. Each chain, each of three chains, 5,000 warm-up samples. We take 20,000 samples total. Uh, this converges nicely, though. But you do have to sample a lot longer to get good convergence with this model. Okay? All right. And uh, most of you guys, all of you guys, I think, probably have computers that have lots of cores in them. Right? And you're, one of your cores, like I always joke, is playing Spotify. <laughs> the other one's got running a Twitter bot or something. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I know some of you have like eight cores in your computers, and those cores just sit around wanting to do something. Uh, so you can run Markov chains. <laughs> um, no problem at all. Uh, I like to keep my uh, 
my computers have four cores, and uh, I, I always like to keep one core free for the operating system. Otherwise, things would get pretty chunky. Uh, so uh, three would be my advice. You can run more chains. You could distribute eight chains across three cores, and then as each finishes, it'll farm them back. It'll keep farming them out. It has a task list, and it keeps going. Okay. Does producing more cores than chains help you at all? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, if I had like two chains and three cores, uh, I think it would just send it would just send out two tasks to two cores and then and then maybe insult you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it will insult you, but <laughs> um, it's the parallel library in R is what makes this easy. I mean, there is a little bit of footwork in doing it, but it, this is so uh, distributing processes across cores is so much easier than it was even five years ago. Five years ago, man, I had to like go into something called MPI, the multiprocessor interface, and write my own C code to do this stuff, and it was a nightmare. Now it's like, oh wow, where were you all? Where were you all my life? Parallel, I love you, right? It's just so much easier than it used to be. Um, it's it's uh, it's nice. Um, okay, so cross classifying varying slopes. So let me try to summarize this model, and then we can we've got a little bit of time uh, to introduce um, Gaussian processes, motivate it, and then we'll we'll uh, spend some quality time with it on on the first part of Tuesday. Um, that'll keep us on track, actually. So. There are 54 parameters in this model, I think. I think I counted them up right, but you may have to check me because <laughs> they're all over the place. So I think I did the math right. Three average effects, right? There's an alpha and two betas. Those are the average effects. Uh, there's three times seven equals 21 varying effects on actor. Why seven? Because there are seven actors, and there are three parameters per actor. All right, three offset for each actor. There are three times six. It was 18 varying effects on block. Why? Because there are six experimental blocks and three parameters for each block. Um, there are six standard deviations. Why? Because there's three for each cluster type, right? Uh, so that's six total. And six free correlation parameters because there are two correlation matrices of rank three, which implies three correlation parameters atomically inside of them, as drawn by my completely useless diagram, <laughs> mystical <laughs> diagram. Looks like a, I don't know, Ruby's cube. Uh, <laughs> right? that's, so that's a correlation matrix. Diagonal is all ones, and then I'm shading in how many um, free correlation parameters. I think I did it right. Yeah, check my work. I know some of you are checking it. I appreciate that because uh, this is it's hard to. But anyway, fifty something. There are a lot of parameters. WAIC says there are about eighteen uh, effective parameters. And remember, it's not trying to count the parameters. It's telling you a measure of the squish, the flexibility of the model. Why has it? Why so fewer? And the reason is because if you look at the sigmas that get estimated out of this, most of them are really small. Uh, the posterior means, which was being shown in the Precy output down at the bottom, there's only one that's really big, and that's the intercepts across actors, which measure their handedness preferences. Um, there is some variation in slopes, uh, and it's, it's probably uh, important for some of the individuals. Um, but in general, you get a lot of regularization from the fact that these standard deviations are small, so that creates a, it creates a lot of shrinkage. It regularizes a lot, so the different intercepts, all the offsets across actors and blocks are not very free. It's like they have a really strong regularizing prior on them, so they can't overfit the sample. Uh, and this is the great thing about adaptive priors. Uh, as long as you've got the computational power, you don't have to guess how much regularization you need. Um, uh, you can learn it uh, this way. Okay, you excited? <laughs> Everybody, I can tell that. Yeah, you're like you're excited to get outside, to get out of this room. <laughs> yeah, so am I. But no, uh, uh, but let's uh, not because I want to run away from you guys, but because it's nice out. Um, California. Those of you watching at home, sucks not to be in California. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, I've seen the weather on the other side of the country. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, um, so very quickly, uh, multi-level heuristics. Before I shift into. Uh, uh, just a conceptual introduction to Gaussian processes. Um, then this is my attempt to be horoscopic, right? And uh, here's here's the way I work. That uh, in the sense of the most transferable uh, advice I can give you across cases, knowing nothing about the data you're working with, um, it's often nice to begin with what I call the empty model, which is in the sense there are no predictor variables in it, but you have varying intercepts uh, on each of the cluster types of interest. So in the chimpanzee data, that'd be accurate block. And what this does is it gives you a hierarchical analysis of variance with pooling. And it gives you an idea where the action is. Uh, is the variation among actors? Is it among blocks? And in this case, the answer would be, oh, all the actions across actors. And there's really nothing going on with blocks. And then you might decide, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put blocks aside now. Uh, and I'm going to focus on actors. 
And then you can start putting the extra things in. And yeah, these are good horoscopes, by the way. You can read them in your free time. <laughs> I can tell Katrina has already spotted the interesting part of the slide. <laughs> but uh, uh, add predictors in, and I like to let everything vary. So I'd like to say, um, let's assume there might be some variation in slopes, and let me try to measure it. And if it turns out the sigmas for a particular varying slope are small, then it's usually harmless to just drop that. It makes it computationally more efficient. Or you could leave it in if you've got processor power to burn. Predictions will be pretty much identical uh, if it's small. Predictions will be really different if the variance is big, because that means even if the average slope is nearly zero, so there's no average effect of the intervention or treatment or whatever it is, um, the exposure, um, there may be substantial variation in how the individual units in the data have responded. And that can stimulate your thinking about what unmeasured covariates explain that variation in response. It implies there are interactions that you can chase. And there's your next paper. Right. The papers are what keep us alive in this business. Right? <laughs> uh, but no, it helps you discover science. It helps you figure out the nature of what's going on. Um, so, And then always consider uh, two sorts of posterior prediction in these models. For the same units, you're, you're asking what happened in these data. It's a direct inference problem. And then there's the forecasting issue. What might we expect for new units? And that's a question about the population parameters, about the, what you've measured about the adaptive prior itself. Um, and then, as always, you may know things that trump all of this. right? You may have a particular purpose, and you've got to trust your gut, because you know more about the system than any statistician does. It's your system. Right? Um, questions? All right. Bank your question. Yeah, question. When, when you're saying that you can drop the variant well, this is a case where I think this is a safe statement. So if the sigma is close to zero, that means there's almost no variation across the slopes or intercepts for that cluster. Okay. And you're going to get the same posterior predictions, uh, whether you include that or not for the most part. So that's why I say it's safe to do it. But you should try the experiment and see. Uh, if, you, if you're ever in doubt, you don't, one of the things I love about this modeling business is it, it doesn't require you to be clever. If you want to know if something makes a difference, do it both ways. Uh, that's what I do. I avoid trying to be clever because then you just out-clever yourself usually. At least I, I'm speaking for myself. So I try to be clever, I just out-trick myself. I just like, then I, I just like to be, I'm going to emphasize this next week. What I love about the Bayesian approach to inference is that it obviates the need to be clever. You can just brute force, relentless, ruthless application of the laws of conditional probabilities. That's all it is. People ask me a question, you know, the information stated, I condition on that, I get an inference, and it's always right. It's just, I love it. And it means I don't have to be clever. And I, I don't want to have to, I don't want my career to depend upon being clever. So that's why I do it. And I'll emphasize this next week, because this is what's going to help us construct measurement error and missing data models. You don't have to intuit the consequences of measurement error and missing data. You can let the model do all the logic. All you have to do is state what you know about them, and it just does it for itself. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm encouraging you to say here, is that you don't have to intuit what's going to happen. Just do the comparison. Uh, but I think this is the safest advice I can give you. Yeah. OK. Was it Hank? Did you have your hand up? No? OK. Go ahead. What about Dylan. Rho? If, if Rho is a near zero, would you just model it as its, it's the correlation to zero? Well, uh, then it gets tricky, because uh, you could. Um, for that particular row, you could just fix it at a zero or do something. But um, then it might get tricky computationally, too, because now you're, you're going to have some covariance matrix where you're plugging in. You're going to have to construct it a different way. Uh, in raw stand code, that'd be easy to do. In map to stand, I think that'd be a chore. Uh, so if you want to do that sometime, come to me and ask me. I can show you how to do it. Yeah, you can, you can build these covariance matrices from scratch inside the stand code a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and we're going to do that with Gaussian processes uh, as well. Um, anyway, other questions right now? Questions will occur to you guys, so bank them and bring them to me next week, uh, especially as you start in the homework for this. The homework for this content is already up on the website. Um, and uh, there are two questions. I tell you exactly what to do in both of them. And they're both varying intercept, varying slope problems. And I think they'll be pretty, uh, you'll have fun with them. They're not so bad. But it will force you to learn those. Is this the last homework? Yes, good question. Um, and I plan to talk about that at the beginning of Tuesday. But yeah, this is the last homework. Next week, on Thursday, you're getting the final exam to take home and spend a glorious week with. Uh, it's easier than the homeworks. It is. It's easier than the homeworks. It has to be, because I let you guys work in groups on the homeworks. Right? Uh, yeah, so you can feel the burn. <laughs> right? Uh, and these will be easy. Uh, 
I told you you're going to the Grand Canyon, assholes. And so, <laughs> <laughs> no, as I said, I would go with you. Uh, you could probably do this, you know, on a donkey. Anyway, all right, I got five minutes. Uh, let me spend five minutes motivating the beginning of uh, of Gaussian processes, and then I'll start on the formal definition of them. Uh, on Tuesday when you come back, um, and that'll set us up to keep us exactly on track for the content, actually. So um, here's, here's a paper I really like, uh, and I'm sure some of you have seen this before. It's, it's a neat effect. Um, I am Gen X. I don't know any other Gen Xers in here. You're all millennials. Yeah, you're Gen X. Yeah, Woo, Gen X, right? So we're, we're the Winona Ryder generation. <laughs> and uh, reality bites, and, uh, or is it sucks? Bites, bites, sucks, bites. Yeah, I can't remember. It's both. It does both. And uh, so a peculiar thing about Gen X Americans is that we're pretty conservative on average. I mean, not me. Right, but uh, they're always outliers. But uh, but uh, uh, but we're the most conservative American cohort still alive, um, age adjusted, because uh, there's also an age effect. People get more conservative the older they get, and um, and so you can see this in election years. So we're looking at here on the graph on the left hand side. This is from a paper by uh, Gitsa and Gelman uh, on cohort effects in uh, socialization effects in the American electorate. Each of these colors is a different election, and what you're showing is across birth years of individuals who voted in the election, the proportion of Republican vote that they contributed, right? So this is a partisanship graph. It's often called in political science with the 50-50 line drawn here. And so all of them have a similar kind of shape. Now, there are offsets because, look, for example, the 2008 election uh, in which Barack Obama was elected was less conservative than basically any other election in living memory for most people, right? It was a landslide. Uh, election, which immediately landslid the other direction at the midterms, but that's the American electorate, right? <laughs> I'm still not happy. <laughs> 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 right? Sorry, that's just that's how it goes. Um, so, but what I want you to see is this incredible symmetry across a bunch of elections. There are overall shifts, but the cohort effects are very persistent, and individuals at the same age have very similar partisanship. This is a fascinating phenomenon. Um, and, uh, so individuals, so Gen X is, you know, around here somewhere, and, uh, uh, we're this partisan lump right here that's very conservative. And what's that about, you might start thinking, and what explains the other effects? Because, um, the millennials on the other side are much more liberal, and then the, uh, the baby boomers on the other side of, of me, uh, are more liberal as well. And then you have the great generation, which is uh, the greatest generation, they call themselves, uh, which, <laughs> which is almost as conservative as my generation, but not quite. And what's going on here is to be, to be explained in part by the graph in the lower right. Uh, the party in power and how popular they are, the party that holds the White House, and how popular they are when you get near voting age has a lifetime-long effect on your partisanship. Maybe not you in particular, but on the average person. Right? So obviously didn't on me, but, uh, but on average. And so what you're observing here is they did, uh, uh, Dietz and Gelman did these nice age-weighted regressions where they tried to figure out using age as a continuous category. So you imagine individuals who, who were all around 18 years old um, when, say, Reagan was in the White House. And this is the Gen X effect, Reagan or Bush 1. The uh, Republican Party was popular despite the fact that it was selling weapons to terrorists and then, you know, funneling cocaine into L.A. and all the other stuff that it was doing. It remained insanely popular. But some of you don't know that story. Ask me sometime. <laughs> but uh, 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 it was incredibly popular. And um, so if you became a political age around that time, you identified as Republican. And that has had a lifelong lasting influence on many Americans. It's incredible. And uh, if you became a political age right around the time of the second, the second term of the second Bush, uh, and then around the 2008 election, it was the opposite effect. Now you're lifetime way more liberal. And that's how a lot of these you know, second bump millennials are, right? And, uh, uh, and then there are other effects as well of the popularity. Um, uh, and it's who's in the White House and whether they're popular or not has these lasting effects. It's not everything. So what they figured out is where the ages are. Uh, that have these effects. And you need to continue, this is kind of a continuous category because it isn't, the idea is there's this exposure, this popular culture exposure around the time you become a voting age. But not, it's not that magically exactly at the same age everybody gets that exposure and no one else does. There's diffusion around it. 
there's kind of a range of ages. And the further you get from 18, the less you're paying attention. So you're not retuning your bars into it. This is the theory of age pants. Uh, but some people do. So there's a diffuse kind of effect away from distance. Some ages are politically more similar to others, the more similar the ages are in calendar years. So this is kind of a, there's, there's a, an issue here where every age kind of has its own varying intersect, which is its partisanship. But they aren't discrete categories now. Uh, because there's covariance between intercepts of different ages as a function of how close they are in years. So this is what I mean by continuous categories. And in data situations like this, you can, you, you can extend the varying intercept logic to continuous diffusion processes like this, where there are unmeasured exposures, uh, like who was in the White House at the time you turned 18 and how popular they were, that diffuse out as a function of distance from some particular age or, or location or anything else you want to categorize units in your data across. This is a very powerful family of models um, called Gaussian process regression. And when you guys return on Tuesday, I'll show you how to do it. Thank you.